We all rely on farmers and ranchers, but farming is riskier than other businesses out there. Crop insurance helps farmers manage their risk. With crop insurance, farmers put skin in the game by paying premiums and shouldering deductibles. That keeps taxpayers from having to pick up the whole bill every time disaster strikes. Today, about 90% of U.S. farmland is insured, providing $100 billion in protection to more than 130 different kinds of crops. It's a testament to the program's success. Thank you for joining us for our AgriPulse Washington Week interview. I'm Spencer Chase, joined as always by AgriPulse Executive Editor Phil Brasher, discussing the week that was, agriculturally speaking, in Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C. this week, the government shutdown uh, has crept into its 27th day uh, here as we record on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, not a ton in terms of progress toward ending that shutdown is uh, visible to the public at this point, but there was some agricultural news uh, in regards to the government shutdown that happened this week. Uh, a couple of items that we want to mention to you. First First one being uh, Farm Service Agency offices uh, temporarily reopened across the country. About half of the offices, about a quarter of the FSA workforce uh, returning to work uh, today, tomorrow and Tuesday. Uh, Monday, of course, being the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. So uh, that's uh, the three days that the offices will be open. And those offices are being reopened in order to satisfy 1099 requirements for uh, farmers taxes, uh, service existing uh, FSA loans, but uh, not to uh, create or service any new loans, uh, nor will the they uh, be addressing new applications to the market facilitation program or certifying 2018 production, things of that nature. Uh, but, Phil, we also wanted to talk about something else that happened in regards to the government shutdown, and that's uh, this dispute over disaster aid that really we saw kind of at the tail end of 2018 is now creeping into the beginning of 2019 and getting tied into the government shutdown. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, farmers in the southeast from North Carolina to Georgia, Florida, and of course the wildfires in California, they are really eager to get some disaster aid. The uh, cotton crop across uh, uh, southern Georgia, uh, second leading cotton producing state, uh, was, was devastated. Um, and they're looking for aid. There was a package on the House floor the Democrats brought out, had a lot of Republican support initially, uh, $3 billion in agricultural aid in there, but then uh, the shutdown politics uh, intervened. Uh, the Democratic leadership attached a, uh, a provision in the, uh, in the disaster bill to uh, reopen the government until February the 8th. Of course, the Republicans are saying to the Democrats, no, you've got to have a deal with President Trump first. That's, that's where we've stayed for weeks now, uh, four weeks to be exact. And um, so uh, the bill passed only on a party line and uh, it's not gonna go anywhere in the Senate. So we're stuck. Here we are, and you mentioned <laughs> President Trump. Uh, Phil and I, and uh, or as well as uh, Sarah Wyant, were in New Orleans earlier this week for the uh, 100th Annual Convention of the American Farm Bureau Federation, where President Trump uh, spoke, was, uh, was very, very warmly received, uh, made a number of remarks. Uh, the speech lasted about an hour. In uh, second straight year, he's been in attendance, but this year's speech, uh, just kind of in the, the, the tenure of the moment, uh, was focused pretty heavily on border security and uh, his desire for, for a border wall at the uh, southern border of the United States. States and Mexico. Uh, a lot of comments on that front. Also had some things to say about farm labor, uh, some comments that were uh, warmly received by the by the membership there. Uh, made some comments on trade, but uh, didn't go as far on that subject as he did on some others, perhaps uh, knowing the audience he was speaking to. But uh, Phil, it's it's kind of hard to, to underscore just how just how warmly he was received with, within that room and with that audience. He was, and uh, certainly the White House knew that, um, and it allowed him, gave him a form to make his uh, case, um, get on the offensive about the, uh, uh, his demands for funding the border wall. And with that receptive audience, standing ovations uh, certainly didn't hurt at all. And of course, as you mentioned, he uh, made the, the, the mention of ag labor needs and said he um, uh, understands that, uh, wants, to, wants to address it. Of course, the big question is how? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we didn't get an answer there. <laughs> Not terribly surprising. Right, so still still a number of things yet to be determined on that front. Uh, also, before we let you go, I do want to mention some action that happened here on Capitol Hill. Uh, that being something that we had been expecting uh, to it's kind of a further process and something we've been expecting for a while. And that being the confirmation hearing of Andrew Wheeler to be the next administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. He's currently serving in an acting capacity and has been since July when uh, Scott Pruitt resigned the position. But 
uh, Phil, that hearing didn't have uh, too much in terms of explosive commentary. He's, uh, you know, it's not really the personality of Andrew Wheeler to, to, get, uh, to get too explosive, but did offer some commentary on things like renewable fuels, climate change, uh, on a path to a potential conf confirmation from the Senate. Yeah, he didn't, uh, I think the important thing for him is that he didn't do anything to cause any problems for himself. He uh, should have strong Republican support. Uh, I, would, you know, I would imagine a lot of Democrats will vote against it, if not all of them. Um, however, you know, he um, answered, he, for example, they asked, he, was, he was grilled about climate as we expected, the climate change. He said it's a, um, a huge issue, but uh, it, you know, declined to say it was a crisis. Um, and as you mentioned, he mentioned the E15, he said they were still on track to get uh, that done uh, by the, that rule out before the summer as long as the uh, shutdown only la is last a reasonable length of the time. <laughs> Define reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Who knows? Yeah, and uh, as, he didn't define it, <laughs> right? And he didn't, uh, nor nor would he dare to do so. Uh, as we mentioned, we're in we're in our twenty seventh day of this. Uh, I don't know if they're uh, aiming for a, for a cool month before they uh, get, make this uh, make this thing come to an end. But uh, also important to note, uh, the uh, the house will not be in recess next week. Uh, they had said they would not be in recess if the government remained shut down. That is the case mm -hmm. here. Uh, they will be back in town uh, after the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, uh, which has you know traditionally been a, a district work period on Capitol Hill, but uh, will not be the case this year. Uh, also, we mentioned President Trump's speech. Uh, after his remarks to the Farm Bureau, he returned to the White House where he uh, hosted a fast food feast <laughs> for the Clemson football team. And I was going to say, if there's any Clemson football players watching this, tweet me. I want some details. But uh, I think that's going to do it for the uh, Ag Policy news and information of this week. Uh, for Phil Brasher, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one.